from the top rope, and the great American bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. Let's get into this issue. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, March 29, 1999 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. ESPN program on drug deaths in the pro wrestling industry, ECW Living Dangerously Review, more. The March 30th ESPN Outside the Lines television show one-hour piece on the pro wrestling industry has become something very much talked about within an industry that seemingly only sees reporting as black and white. Either pieces are favorable, or in most cases, they are considered negative. I suspect the ESPN piece will be fair and the best of its kind, that will end up being something to judge after it airs because there are many pieces where I've thought that going in that haven't turned out to be the case, but the show itself has a great reputation and based on their level of research into this subject, they weren't treating it in what is often a typical journalistic manner that since the matches are scripted, it isn't worthy of scrutiny. Whether that end result turns out to be positive or negative may be based more on how one judges pro wrestling to begin with. In what appears to be a classic WWF peremptory strike, Jim Ross, on the promotion's website, mentioned the piece in a negative fashion late in the week, after Vince McMahon was interviewed on March 18th, and virtually every major player in the industry was talked with in regards to this piece, comparing the piece to a Phil Mushnick column, an interesting name to use in an analogy in light of what was to happen this past weekend. The piece will likely delve into the issue of possible drug-related deaths of active wrestlers, as there were interviews done with Melanie Smith, the former Melanie Pillman, Missy Hyatt the former Melissa Gilbert, Tina Mucciolo, the younger sister of Louis Spicoli. Dana Hall, who has been outspoken in her criticism of the industry in regard to its substance abuse problems in recent months I don't believe was interviewed since she and Scott are attempting another reconciliation. The one positive point in regard to the subject that I felt with ESPN is that there has been no attempt to sensationalize the points and the deaths, but to put them into perspective. While I don't know how this will end up being portrayed on the show, it's probably time rather than emotionally after a death, but during a week when nobody died, to address the subject of deaths of active wrestlers. This is a hard subject to accurately ascertain as there is no such thing as a complete listing that I know of. It appears to me that a few independent wrestlers pass away every year that are largely unknowns and that virtually nobody ever remembers. So these are deaths of what I would call either name active wrestlers, or deaths which for whatever reason, and maybe due to their nature, got a decent amount of publicity over the period of 1993 to the present. As mentioned, this is an incomplete list and with all the wrestling that goes on in the world, I doubt it would be possible to provide a complete list. January 27, 1993, Andrei Rusimov, Andrei the Giant, 46, heart attack. February 18, 1993, Kerry Adkisson, Kerry Von Erich, 33, suicide one day after being indicted on cocaine charges while already being on probation for a conviction for forging prescriptions. March 11, 1993, Adolfo Brescino, Dino Bravo, 44, murder, believed to be gangland retribution style. October 26, 1993, Oro, 21, brain aneurysm during a match. December 13, 1993, Larry Cameron, 41, heart attack during a match. May 23, 1994, Ray Candy, Ray Candy, 43, heart attack. November 23, 1994, Art Bar, Love Machine, 28, combination of alcohol and pain killing drugs. January 22, 1995, Crusher Blackwell, Jerry Blackwell, 45, pneumonia. February 18, 1995, Thomas Gilbert, 3, Eddie Gilbert, 33, heart attack with the autopsy showing recent cocaine use. March 20, 1995, John Minton, Big John Stud, 46, liver cancer. June 15, 1996, Heart Richard Murdoch, Dick Murdoch, 49, heart attack. August 23, 1996, Neil Karakoff, Neil Superior, 33, heart attack with the autopsy showing recent steroid and GHB usage. August 16, 1997, Marco Ometa, Plum Marco, 29, brain aneurysm during a match. October 5, 1997, Brian Pillman, 35, heart attack with the autopsy showing recent cocaine use. February 15, 1998, Louis Mucciolo, Louis Spicoli, 27 heart attack after recent heavy usage of somas and alcohol combination. June 2, 1998, Sylvester Ritter, Junkyard Dog, 45, auto accident. August 17, 1998, Brian Hauser, Shane Shamrock, 23, shot by police during domestic dispute. January 31, 1999, Shohei Baba, Giant Baba, 61, bowel cancer. 
February 23, 1999, Richard Wilson, Renegade, 33, Suicide. March 1, 1999, Satoshi Hasegawa, 22, Accidental Death Falling Off a Building Ledge. In all, this listing has 20 deaths over the past 6 years. I'm going to immediately take several names off the list at random, largely for reasons having to do with nothing other than accurate statistical purposes of whatever point this is going to make. Off the list are Oro, because we simply don't have enough complete records on deaths in Mexico and statistically this can't be used, Umeda, Baba and Hasegawa. While we have complete records for Japan, we aren't including Japan in this profile. I have questions regarding Shane Shamrock and Neil Superior in that they were indie wrestlers, although they were probably name enough indie wrestlers to fit into a profile of the top 250 wrestlers domestically if we were to make such a list although both names can surely be debated. One could also question Blackwell and Stud, who were both major stars in their day, but neither active at the time of their death, however both wrestled until the health failings that caused their death. So we are talking 16 deaths over 6 years of American wrestlers. I did include Cameron and Gilbert even though their deaths were not in the United States, but because they were both regular American wrestling at the time of their death, and had they not died would have both wrestled in the United States in their future. Anyway, from a pure statistical standpoint, just to put to rest any ideas that if you took that same number of people at that age over that many years, you'd have similar results when it comes to number of deaths and this simply isn't a story. We checked with actuarial tables among people of that age group and found that the death rate among active pro wrestlers using this six-year period as the model was roughly 975% higher or nearly 11 times that of an average segment of society. This all depends how you do your figures as using different calculations we've come from 700% to 1200% greater death rate than average but this would be the average figure. For a comparison, this would be equivalent to during a season, having approximately 8 active Major League Baseball players or 14 NFL players or 16 Division I basketball players or 105 Division I football players die during the course of a one-year period every season, with about 44% of those being attributed somewhat to drugs, 25% to cocaine or downers and the other 19% tied in some form to steroids. That is roughly the magnitude of this problem being unsensationalized and not through potentially overplaying sob stories about one or two individuals. Now comes the harder question. Is this indicative of the pro wrestling industry, the pro wrestling lifestyle, or bad luck? The answer is that it is too frequent to be attributed to bad luck, although as with society as a whole and with wrestling, a few of the deaths such as JYD in a car accident possibly fall under that view, and since wrestlers spend so much time in a car going from city to city, although less now than at any time in history, there are going to be an above average amount of highway deaths. That still doesn't explain the extraordinarily high number of drug deaths, Far more importantly, what can be done and could any of them have been avoided? Is it because more crazy people wind up in pro wrestling that go in with drug problems greater than society at large and thus a higher percentage die? Or is it because the drugs in wrestling breed this problem? First we have to go into causes of death of the 16 men remaining on the list. Andre was suffering from a glandular disease which made him Andre the Giant, and it would be unfair to say wrestling caused him to die any younger. If Kerry Von Erich was never a wrestler, would he be alive today? Almost certainly. Ditto for his brothers. Bravo's death had more to do with his apparent gangland connections in Montreal and nothing to do with his participation in the pro wrestling industry. Cameron's death has long been attributed to steroids but like most all steroids deaths that can't be said conclusively. The fact is of the 16 men we are listing, at least 11, maybe more, were steroid users a percentage probably not far from the same as the percentage of major league pro wrestlers that have used steroids at some point in their career. Does that mean anything? Probably in some cases and probably not in others, but it would be impossible for anyone to really say which ones it does and doesn't. One of my doctors who is considered something of an authority on steroids and works with Olympic athletes on beating the test told me the day after Flo Joe's death that your heart has just so many beats for a lifetime and steroids do cut into that number. That doesn't mean for a steroid user who gets a heart attack at 25 or 35 that the steroids were or weren't part of the equation, the percentage of these men that used cocaine or a bad reaction to alcohol and pills is probably a far more serious danger at least in the short run. Realistically there is evidence that drugs other than steroids could have been in the equation of four deaths. Barr, Gilbert, Pillman and Spicoli, while steroids can be tied to three, Cameron, Superior and John Studd. The point when it comes to Cameron is, if he had not been a pro wrestler, would he be alive today? Any answer to this question would be irresponsible because we don't know if steroids played a part in his death. If they did, probably yes. Canty, like Blackwell, was a huge man who was terribly overweight. 
In both cases, health problems probably were more from weight problems than problems developed while being active wrestlers. There is something, at least in their cases, that since pro wrestling employs men so much larger than average and Blackwell, Canty and Andre were all 400 to 530 pound men in their early 40s that their risk factors for living a long life were not good to begin with. When it comes to Baba, some believe it's a miracle that he did live to 60 because he had elements of giantism like Andre. At the same time, the rank and file wrestler on this list taking Blackwell, Canty and Andre out and maybe even Murdoch, seemingly if anything, being athletic and having to keep in reasonable condition to perform in an athletic environment, should if anything on average be in far better condition than the average American male of the same age group and thus their death rate should if anything be lower than average, rather than many multiples of what average is. I hope nobody even suggests that Barr, Gilbert, Pillman and Spicoli would most likely not be alive today had they not been pro wrestlers. Those four all had a lot in common in that they were tremendously driven, Spicoli less than the other three but he still basically lived for pro wrestling, and very good performers, all lacking in size to be considered headliners by normal standards but all with way above average ability to work. In the case of Stud, many years ago his doctor was on ABC's Wide World of Sports, which did a segment about pro wrestlers dying young, and flat out said his liver cancer was attributed to steroids. Murdoch was just a 49-year-old who lived hard and played hard and had put on a lot of weight in the last few years of his life and things like that can add up. Superior had an altercation with police and in the middle of the altercation suffered a heart attack and died, with tests showing recent steroid and GHB, a drug popular at the time among bodybuilders and women for cutting fat, in his system. What can be done? That's the question with no easy answers. In companies that had real drug testing that wouldn't at some level be considered a joke, which is limited really to the WWF from 1993 to 1996 and to any promotion running in Oregon which was basically nobody, nobody died under that purvey although Spicoli did nearly die of a drug overdose while he was working for the WWF and before the company pulled back on drug testing. Since the drugs that were his problem the somas, were not being tested for since he had prescriptions for them. Drug testing probably would have made no difference when it comes to the death of Barr and Spicoli, although I can't say that conclusively either. If cocaine was a contributing cause of Gilbert's death as it appears, had he worked for a company that had real drug testing, perhaps it would have been a signal that he needed help. Over the past year plus I have gone over and over in my head whether the WWF had continued drug testing, that it may have saved Pillman's life. The answer, sorry to say, is that I'm not sure, which may be a pretty strong argument against the dropping of testing. If he had failed a test, and his heart was damaged by recent cocaine use, it would have alerted people to the problem. Would he have gotten help, or would it have just plunged him deeper is a question I can't answer. But he would not have been on the road as much as he was, and hindsight being 2020, the WWF and Pillman both made a huge mistake in trying to make him a full-time house show wrestler, in the condition he was in, even though he not just willingly came back but practically insisted on doing so. If this was football, it would almost be considered piling on. WWF nearly set another raw record on March 22nd with a 6.44 rating, the record 6.46 was set on March 8th, which were 6.45 and 6.43 hours and a 10.2 total share. It did set the all-time record for biggest ratings gap as Nitro fell to a 3.95 rating, 4.76 first hour, 3.60 seconds hour, 3.50 third hour, and a 6.1 share. Nitro did just a 3.55 concurrent rating which meant on average nearly a 3 points rating gap for the 2 plus hours in a terrible show from Panama City. Historically, the spring breakout Nitro has been a record setter, and I guess it was this year as well, just in the wrong direction. There was literally nothing good on the show with the exception of Tori Wilson and some fitness models in bikinis in a segment that was designed to put over Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan and even then lost by more than two points in the ratings when going head up with Blue Meanie attempting to spank Ryan Shamrock. For the night, Raw was viewed by 7,320,000 viewers its all-time record. Over the head-to-head -head period Nitro was viewed by 3,820,000 viewers, or barely half of the Raw audience. It was never close, and in the final quarter hour, with Nitro having Scott Steiner vs. Chris Jericho and Raw having Steve Austin vs. Paul White, it was outright destruction to the tune of a 7.10 to 2.92 margin. The Austin White quarter hour would make it the second most watched quarter hour wrestling match in the history of cable television being seen in 5,351,000 homes, trailing only the Bill Goldberg vs. Diamond Dallas Page WCW title match last October, 5,367,000 homes.
In the over on 5 minutes the climax of Austin vs. White did a 7.65 rating which translates into more than 8.6 million total viewers. WCW's Rey Mysterio Jr. vs. Ric Flair main event did a 3.51 rating, but that's actually misleading because Nitro went 2 minutes longer than Raw, which means that match was benefited by Raw going off early and probably over the head-to-head -head period was closer to a 3.0. While the gap was a little surprising, anyone who saw the two shows, or has followed the two products, can't be at all surprised by the freefall WCW is undergoing and despite all the buck passing going on, it is clear that Hogan, Nash and Bischoff have to be held responsible even if all point fingers at the other ones when it comes time to take that responsibility. As the demographic destruction continues, here is where it's at now in comparing the head-to-head -head 2 hours and 5 minutes. Men 18 to 24 has Raw with 850,000 viewers and Nitro with 289,000, 75% Raw. Men 25 to 54 has Raw with 1,972,000 viewers and Nitro with 1,439,000, 58% Raw. Men 55 plus has Raw with 394,000 and Nitro with 327,000 viewers. 55% Raw, Women 18 to 24 has Raw with 407,000 viewers and Nitro with 72,500. 85% Raw in a demographic that one year ago was 70% Nitro, Women 25 to 54 has 1,054,000 for Raw and 487,000 for Nitro. 68% Raw, Women 55 plus has 301,000 for Raw and 283,000 for Nitro. 52% Raw which is the first time ever that Raw has beaten Nitro in this demo. Ages 2 to 11 has 1,049,000 for Raw and 394,000 for Nitro. 73% Raw, and Teenagers has 1,273,000 for Raw and 529,000 for Nitro. 71% Raw. In something of a remarkable note, the first hour of Nitro drew 954,000 kids 2 to 11 and the second hour drew only 438,000. In other words, almost as many kids watch the first hour of Nitro as watch Raw, but more than half turned the channel at 9 p.m. ECW's second pay-per-view show of the year was very similar to the first. ECW can't match WCW and WWF when it comes to production, and generally for talent, although this show wound up with as many good matches as the other company's better shows. ECW always competes well when it comes to effort and high-risk moves, and when it comes to booking, like all companies, it has its hits and misses. Living Dangerously overall was a good show. The first half of the show, with both the Super Crazy vs. Yoshihiro Tajiri and Jerry Lynn vs. Rob Van Dam matches, was better than the first half of most pay-per-view shows nowadays. The next three matches were all bad, and worse, all dragged on far too long. I had the show as a slight thumbs down going into the main event but Sabu vs. Taz was a very strong finish. The show on March 21st from the Asbury Park, New Jersey Convention Center drew a sellout of approximately 3,900 paying $100,000 and another $28,000 in merchandise. From all accounts, the show was far better live than it came across on TV because of sometimes suspect camera work and always suspect sound. Matches in particular the Crazy vs. Tajiri opener, that had good heat live came off on television as having no heat at all. The show still had a feel, both watching on television and from the arena is feeling like a house show and a good house show at that, but just a house show on television as opposed to a pay-per-view event. A lot of that is simply ECW with a $250,000 budget for a show can't compete with what people have grown to expect from higher budgeted events from the larger companies. There was also a feeling from those live that the audience at ECW is very similar to the audience at WWF, and probably WCW as well, in that they are looking for angles and storylines and get bored with lengthy matches, even when the matches themselves are very good. Paul Heyman from a booking standpoint is at an interesting crossroads, since ECW has survived presenting an alternative product, but WWF has basically taken the ECW product, used more charismatic performers and better athletes and higher production values, and made it something that makes ECW simply look like the low-rent version. Heyman, in trying to go to a new formula, tried to emphasize hard athletic matches among solid workers whose personalities haven't been developed as outrageously, and 70s title match or Japanese title match mindset in belt matches of trying to bring respectability and credibility to the titles as something athletic. Both Van Dam vs. Lin and Sabu vs. Taz ending with a handshake and with the winner verbally putting over the loser for giving him a great match rather than rubbing it in, which in both cases the live crowd didn't want to see. The more popular in your face mentality was reserved more for shots by Taz at the other big stars and world champions. Fans clearly didn't want to see Antifas del Norte vs. Little Guido on a big show, 
and were loudly chanting boring because neither is over as a personality, but in the ring both men worked hard and took major risks. A. Nova, Mike Bucci, and Chris Chetty beat Danny During, Daniel Morrison, and Amish Roadkill, Mike Deeply, in what was said to have been a good dark match. The show opened with Taz issuing the challenge to big stars from other organizations, asking if anyone believes that 50-year-old Ric Flair could beat him, the most important aspect of real competition within pro wrestling are who can draw television ratings, and by that criteria, Flair could be 100 and he'd still win easily. And praised Steve Austin as a good entertainer and a good athlete but he could still tap him out. Thank God he didn't bring up Paul White, because I think few people in the universe, and whether he could or couldn't in real life is irrelevant in pro wrestling, believe he'd have a prayer. 1. Super crazy, Francisco Pontoa Islas, defeated Yoshihiro Tajiri in 955. This was a good opener, but a disappointment because every house show match between the two that has aired on television has been considerably better than this match. This was billed as the final match between the two and the winner of this match would be the winner of the feud. Actually the first half of the match was excellent lucha and the crowd appreciated it. Tajiri did a running flip dive and an Osai moonsault early. At this point they did some dive spots onto the ramp, and the ramp ruined the visual effect of the spots which is where the match was hurt, including an Osai moonsault onto the ramp which simply looked wrong. Crazy then started doing one moonsault after another in the ring to the point nobody cared about the moonsault. The match also had zero transitions. On his sixth moonsault type move, Crazy got nailed when Tajiri got the knees up. Tajiri did a sliding kick with Crazy hanging upside down. Crazy slipped on a springboard leading to the loudest reaction of the bout, a huge UF, head up. After two dozen hot matches with nary a miss spot and one big miss, and the crowd killed the finish. Crazy wound up getting the pin with a sunset flip after several reversals. Two and a half stars. Two. Balls Mahoney, John Reschner, pinned Steve Corino in 356. Corino came out and said both guys in the previous match sucked and that he didn't take steroids, and from the looks of things nobody will accuse him of it, and didn't wrestle in foreign countries and challenged anyone from the back. The place went nuts chanting for Sid, but instead Axel Rotten and Mahoney came out. They both worked hard and it was kept quick but there was little to it. The only bad spot was Corino taking a spin bump from a clothesline that missed. Rotten clotheslined Corino T1 point on the floor. Mahoney at his size did a splash off the top about two-thirds of the way across the ring for a near fall. A funny spot saw Corino grab a chair, but instead of using it, he sat down in it and applied a chin lock to get crowd heat. Mahoney got the pin after a side kick and a hard chair shot to the head. One quarter star. Three. Little Guido James Maritato pinned Antifas del Norte, Jesus Gonzalez in 537. Guido was accompanied by Sal E. Graziano, both wearing FBI shirts, with them talking about the breakup with Guido and Tracy Smothers last week in Philadelphia. Graziano was carrying the Tommy Rich flag. Fans weren't into this match although both worked hard. Guido did some UWFI style early which fans here don't understand. Antifas did a beautiful corkscrew tope and a springboard sunset flip. They traded hard chops back and forth. Guido debuted a Russian leg sweep off the middle ropes. Loud boring chance at this point. Antifas went for a pescado but Graziano caught him and power slammed him through a ringside table, and threw him into the ring where Guido delivered a leg drop off the middle rope followed by a Boston Crab, called the Italian Crab, for the submission. After the match, Smothers and Rich showed up. Smothers attacked Guido while Rich hit Graziano twice with a flag. Graziano no-sold and chased Smothers and Rich to the back. As you can imagine, it wasn't much of a race. One and one quarter stars. Four. Rob Van Dam, Robert Sotkowski, pinned Jerry Lynn in 118 of an overtime after going to the 20 minutes time limit to retain the ECW TV title. Joey Styles, when the match started, heavily pushed that he believed Lynn would win, which, of course, guaranteed that he wouldn't. This was a really good match, with some innovative spots. It lacked in transitions and didn't build well. In fact, the last four minutes were the worst four minutes of the match as opposed to what it should be. Up to that point, it was really good. At one point Van Dam was standing on the top rope for a springboard move and Lynn dropkicked him to the floor. Lynn was draped over the guard rail while Van Dam leg dropped him off the apron twisting and did a crossbody off the guard rail into the stands. He then did a leg drop off the guard rail while Lynn was draped over the apron which looked good. Van Dam used the La Tapatia, which explains why this was the first night where Super Crazy didn't use the move. Van Dam wanted to do a twisting leg drop but Lynn was out of position and the crowd noticed the missed spot and died. Van Dam missed a monkey flip out of the corner and Lynn did a great sunset flip spot off it. Lynn used a DDT on a chair for a near fall. 
Lynn was on the top rope with a chair but Bill Alfonso held his leg. Lynn hit Van Dam twice with a chair while both were standing on the ropes. Van Dam came back with a Van Daminator, sending Lynn backwards off the ropes to the floor and through a table. They did a series of near fall spot sequence that was actually invented first in ECW years ago in the Dean Malenko vs. Eddie Guerrero matches, climaxing with Lynn hitting a German suplex. Lynn also did a swinging DDT off the ropes outside the ring, through a table that didn't break which probably gave Van Dam a nice headache. At this point they had a loud time cue for the guys to go three more minutes, and at that point the match slowed down as they were simply waiting for the time to end. There were no big moves and no exciting finish at all. The referee, in a play off the Holyfield Lewis draw, was going to award the decision and the title to Lynn, let's see, titles can't change on a DQ or a core, and there are a zillion guys interfering in every title match in every promotion, but they can change on a time limit draw, but Lynn didn't want to win the title that way. He, he was about to be played for a putz. He asked for five minutes, as did Van Dam. Unfortunately, the overtime was exactly like the Michaels Hart WrestleMania match where they went 60 minutes, did an overtime, and went right to a finish as they did a sloppy setup for a Van Daminator, followed by a frog splash for the pin. Both men shook hands after. Later in the show, Van Dam did an interview that he didn't seem comfortable trying to pull off, saying that Lynn brings out the best in him and that as champion, he challenged Lynn to more title matches because he wanted to give people the best matches possible, said he didn't want any BS angles about him hating Lynn, and also challenged him for the next pay-per-view. They also interviewed ref John Finnegan who again made clear he was going to give the title to Lynn. Three and a half stars. At this point in the show they aired a tape of a pre-show angle and started the one hour long period with the show in the toilet. Jasmine St. Clair, a relatively well-known porn actress came out with Lance Wright. She couldn't talk to save her life, but I guess talking isn't what she's known for. Francine came out and looked like she hadn't slept since the Carter administration, she looked much better later in the show, and gave St. Clair the single worst stunner in the history of the industry. She also got on her knees and teased giving Wright one of those simulated sexual practices that all the news reports talk about but instead hit him low. This segment was beyond bad. Like Lance Wright standing there in mid-ring in front of nearly 4,000 people actually believes Francine who he doesn't know is going to give him a blowjob without being the slightest bit suspicious. Francine had to practically beg the crowd to cheer her after this angle and even then it was pretty tame. 5. New Jack, Jerome Young, pinned Mr. Mustafa, Jamal Mustafa, in 927. It was what you'd expect with New Jack basically breaking one thing after another on Mustafa, and Mustafa doing it back to New Jack. It's never very good, but it gets over because of the music and New Jack's charisma, but Mustafa is terrible to begin with, but now not having wrestled much in the last year, was a little out of shape, he's got great genetics but was looking like a guy with great genetics that doesn't go to the gym anymore, and totally rusty. Everything he did was mistimed and looked awful. New Jack bled. This thing was going way too long as they did all they could do in three minutes and could only make it worse. They wound up brawling on the floor. Jack used duct tape to tie Mustafa to a table. Didn't they notice from Uncensored how that stuff doesn't hold in real life? Anyway, Mustafa still sold it like he couldn't get away and New Jack climbed the balcony and jumped off. To his credit, it was by far the single nuttiest spot of 1999. Both guys appeared to have died from the spot. Security basically dragged both of them into the ring and threw them there with Jack getting a pinfall. It took more than two minutes after the dive before security could get them into the ring so the finish was totally anticlimactic. One quarter star. The Dudleys then attacked New Jack again and threw him out of the ring. They did their way too long mic work. Sign guy had a sign that said that Bubba had lost 30 pounds, and it appeared that he had. Unfortunately, Joel Gertner found all of it and more. They challenged anyone from the back. The fans were again chanting for Sid. 6. Sid Sid Aoudi, and Spike Dudley, Matthew Heisen, beat Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley, Mark LaMonica and Devin Hughes, in 11 minutes. Bubba threw Spike into the stands onto the people and he almost made it, actually landing on the guard rail. The people body surfed him around so at least that spot visually worked unlike the last show. They destroyed Nova, who came out with Spike, giving him the 3D. They never went for a pin and it dragged on clumsily from here. Finally ring announcer Bob Ortiz covered Nova, and you knew he was getting the 3D. Bubba then challenged anyone to come out. This dragged on way too long before Jeff Jones brought out Sid. The two double teamed Sid, who was over bigger than anyone on the show, until he made the comeback with a double choke slam. Anyway Jones brought out a stretcher. The idea here was for Sid to powerbomb Devon, which he eventually did, and put him on the stretcher and wheel him out. 
Spike would then come out of the crowd and hit the acid drop on Bubba for the pin, leading to Sid destroying Spike. What did happen was a mess. Sid, I guess, not wanting to leave while he was getting such a big pop, never rolled D. Vaughn out. Spike ran in, but with Sid around, nobody cared and the cameras weren't even on him. Luckily he recognized this and didn't hit his move until the cameras were there, but nobody cared anyway. After the match Sid gave Spike a power bomb and a second power bomb off the ramp through a table and left. One star. 7. Tommy Dreamer, Thomas Lachlan, and Shane Douglas, Troy Martin, beat Just Incredible, Peter Polacco, and Lance Storm Lance Evers, in 1858. This was a long match that simply dragged. The idea of Don Marie as the new Beulah clearly wasn't over a lick. Douglas was in better shape than two weeks ago but when he was in with Credible, it was reminiscent of seeing late 80s Dusty Rhodes versus Tully Blanchard. Except if neither had any charisma nor were over. Credible bumped real well for him. But he was slow and almost immobile in spots, with terrible punches. At least Rhodes could do that, took few bumps and really survived only on suplexes. Lots of missed moves. Dreamer worked hard as always but he's got nothing special for a long match. Especially when his program just isn't hot. Credible and Storm have potential as a tag team but are far from where they need to be for this spot on the show, particularly in the dual charisma department where they have none. Styles said that he thought Douglas would turn on Dreamer. That guaranteed they would tease the spot later in the match and it wouldn't happen. There was no pop at all for hot tags by either Dreamer or Douglas after lengthy heat spots. Finally the new Beulah gave Douglas a low blow which wound up with the cat fight spot. Since Francine was wearing a short dress, you know what that spot was all about. Francine dragged in a ladder. Douglas and Dreamer did the teeter-totter spot nailing both heels. After a few near falls, Credible pulled out the cane and went to hit Douglas. Francine grabbed the cane from behind and stopped him, and then nailed Credible with a round kick. Douglas pinned Credible after a fisherman buster. After the match Don Callis came out, and was called Cyrus the Virus. Credible destroyed Dreamer and Douglas with cane shots. He was about to hit Francine but Cyrus protected Francine, but then gave her a low headbutt. Credible left the ring saying that he wasn't going anywhere. Terry Funk never appeared on the show, so I'm guessing his angle with Dreamer is dropped, at least for now. He did say over the past week that he was winding down his career to its last few matches. One star. 8. Taz Peter Sinurka retained the ECW title in a unification match with FTW champ Sabu, Terry Brunk, in 1828. They added a falls count anywhere stipulation to the match. They played up the entire show how Sabu was only at 70% because of the broken jaw which was probably a concession to him since he hates doing jobs, particularly on a pay-per-view. This was easily Sabu's best performance ever on pay-per-view, as he hit all his spots and carried this to a really good match. Sabu did a springboard dive into the crowd but Taz got a chair up and Sabu crashed into it. They brawled outside the ring for several minutes. Sabu jumped off a chair with a dive off the camp onto Taz in the stands. Taz threw Sabu off the ramp into the crowd. The hottest spot was Taz doing an overhead belly to belly over the top rope with Sabu crashing through a table and the cameraman. Sabu was bleeding from the mouth, probably from biting a condom. Taz started challenging Hogan and Flair. Alfonso wanted to throw in the towel but Sabu wouldn't let him. Taz threw Sabu off the amp again. Alfonso hit Taz with a chair and Sabu delivered a Frankensteiner off the top. He tried a Frankensteiner in the ring but Taz turned it into a power bomb. Sabu tried his power bomb over the top spot but it was totally screwed up because the guardrail was so close to the ring apron it couldn't be executed and they tried to compensate for it which made it look bad. Sabu did do a plancha through a table onto Taz and an Arabian face buster for a near fall. They traded their biggest spots, with Taz using more suplexes and Sabu doing his triple jump moonsault and a triple jump leg drop. The drama was pretty good at this point watching it at home, but today's crowd doesn't get into drama of matches. This was confirmed by those live as the hot crowd burned out in the last two matches. Finally Taz did an overhead belly-to-belly -belly superplex and a dragon suplex through a table. Alfonso again went to throw in the towel, and he blew the spot by throwing it in early. Sabu caught the towel and then had to be put in the choke, the towel should have been thrown in while in the choke instead of Sabu holding the towel waiting for the move, and then threw the towel out again. Sabu didn't tap, but eventually the match was stopped when his arm went limp. After the match Taz put Sabu over verbally talking about what a tough match it was and practically demanded he shake hands. There were some cheers but more boos for the handshake. It should be noted that live 75-80% to of the crowd was cheering for Sabu despite Jersey's proximity to New York. Three and a half stars. 
a few updates and historical corrections in regard to the pieces on Ric Flair and Jumbo Surita on the March 22nd issue. According to Wu, the Ric Flair record book, it is confirmed that the night of the mask where Flair lost the NWA title to the Midnight Rider, only to have it returned after the match because Rider refused to unmask, was in fact on February 9, 1983 in Miami and not Tampa which clears up the question from last week. The book did not have dates or results of Flair's losses and subsequent wins in quickie title changes with Jack Fanano or of the Victor Jovica situation which is actually as more we've learned about it, is something that shouldn't be considered as a world title change. In regard to the situation involving Carlos Colon and Ric Flair, it's actually even more complicated than listed last week. On January 6, 1983 in Roberto Clemente Stadium in San Juan, Carlos Colon, billed as WWC World Heavyweight Champion, defeated Ric Flair, billed as NWA World Heavyweight Champion in what was billed as a title unification match, using the figure four leg lock to submit Flair with no gimmicks or outside interference. The result was simply never acknowledged in the United States. The unified title, billed as the universal title, was first defended on September 17, 1983 at Hiram Bithorn Stadium in San Juan where Cologne beat NWA World Heavyweight Champion Harley Race, who was not billed as world champion for this match. Race had beaten Flair for the NWA title on June 10, 1983. The match we referred to in last week's issue was a cage match after Flair had regained the title from Race. That match was against Cologne on December 18, 1983 at Juan Lubriel Stadium in Bayamon. Cologne was billed as WWC World Heavyweight Champion and Flair as NWA World Heavyweight Champion but the match was for the vacant Universal title and billed as there must be a winner, again a belt signified as being higher than any world title, and not for either version of the World Heavyweight title. This was the match where Cologne got out the door first to win the title. One can try and put sports logic in something that has no logic and say NWA rules at the time didn't allow title changes and out the door finishes but then again in that match the NWA title wasn't at stake. We do not have confirmation of this fact, but there are sketchy historical reports and logic of the fact Cologne was no longer Universal Champion for the December 18, 1983 match indicates a flare win over Cologne between Thanksgiving of 1983 and the December 18 show to win what would be considered the Puerto Rican version of the NWA title. When Cologne held the Universal title in Puerto Rico, for most of 1983, the NWA title, as it pertained to Puerto Rico, no longer existed as a separate title, which is why Race came without the belt when he was the champion in September. The NWA as it existed at that time either didn't know about it, most likely, or went along with all of this because Puerto Rico was its hottest money-drawing territory at the time and for the most part, news from there never left the island. There apparently was a match earlier in December 1983 where Flair beat Cologne but only the NWA title was at stake and not the WWC title. But with the title being split, there was no universal champion. This apparently was how Flair was billed once again as NWA champion in Puerto Rico leading to the December 18th stadium match. Neither Cologne nor Flair was billed as universal champion going into the match but each came out with their respective world heavyweight title belts. In addition, the title change talked about regarding Flair versus Victor Jovica actually took place in Trinidad and not the Dominican Republic as listed. Jovica won the match but used the ropes for an illegal pin. Jovica was actually stripped of the title in the dressing room that night, so that one should not be listed as an NWA title change. I don't even know how anyone attempts from an historical standpoint to explain the Puerto Rican situation in 1983 so I guess you could subtract one world title reign since the Jovica deal shouldn't count and regard Flair as a 17-time, or 21-time world champion. In regard to Jumbo Tsurita, the March 10, 1976 match against Vern Gagne that we listed as last week being a 60 minutes draw just after Tsurita got the word that his original teacher, Masio Koma, had died, was either a double pin or double count out third fall in 46-57. His March 28, 1976 interpromotional match against Rusher Kimura, who at that time was the top native star of the UA, one match of the year that year in Japan that we listed as a 60 minutes draw was also a double count out in the third fall lasting a total of 28-54. The 70 minutes draw with Billy Robinson was on July 17, 1976. In regard to his other bouts winning match of the year honors in Japan, his August 25, 1977 match where he beat Mil Mascaras by a count out to retain the United National title was in 37-54. His January 20, 1978 NWA title match against Harley Race was a 60 minutes draw after splitting two falls. He also won match of the year for his November 4, 1985 60 minutes draw against Ricky Choshu and for his August 31, 1986 match where he lost by a count out to Genichiro Tenryu in Tunmi 135. It would also be incomplete when it comes to running down Surda's career not mentioning his June 8, 1983 NWA title match against Ric Flair, 
which he won the first fall in 29-39 and the match went the 60 minutes time limit, but Surita didn't get the title because he failed to win the second fall, which I believe is the only instance of its type when it comes to the NWA title ever in Japan, I can recall a few instances offhand in the United States as it pertained to that specific title in Kansas City and St. Louis involving Flair losing one fall to race. An interesting footnote to the story was that in 1978 and 1979, sort of put out three record albums as a singer and guitar player attempting to capitalize on his mainstream pro wrestling fame on the Sony label. If you saw the Fox on Sports segment with Vince McMahon on the Fox News Network on March 21st and thought there was some name calling and that someone was a liar and a coward, you're right. Who exactly was the liar and the coward is another story. The segment had been plugged all week with McMahon appearing as a guest on the network's two-hour talk show hosted by Brian Kilmeade and Wally Matthews. During the first hour of the show, devoted to the current heavyweight boxing controversy, the announcers plugged that McMahon would be there and be confronted by his staunchest critic, Phil Mushnick of the New York Post. When the segment started, practically the first words out of McMahon's mouth were, the reason I'm here is to confront Phil Mushnick, who I was promised would be on this show. Phil Mushnick is not on this show. Phil Mushnick is a coward and a liar. Before he could go on, both Kilmeade and Matthews cut him off and went on with an interview for 25 minutes that largely went about as you would expect, with the host being aggressive, but, and they were both willingly admitting it, not being prepared because they were not expecting to be in that role. What happened behind the scenes was a far more interesting story, clearly a black eye for the Fox News Network, and certainly speaks volumes about McMahon's gall as opposed to guts. In the days that have passed as the situation has become more clear, it has become even more heated. McMahon pulled a power play on the show and won, but by winning, may have exposed himself in many people's eyes as being the coward and the liar. In the days that followed the descriptions of McMahon's grandstand challenge, and subsequent backing down, were desperately attempted to be rationalized by his people. Because of McMahon's public persona as someone who never backs down. The WWF version of the story, as stated by WWF Vice President of Marketing Jim Byrne, who set up the appearance, reveals some possible communication breakdowns, but his story was also called 110% false by Kilmeade, and a complete lie by Matthews, both of whom said Mushnick was the victim. Kilmeade said that he finished the segment with even less respect for McMahon than he had before it started, if such a thing was possible. Matthews was far hotter. In the Byrne version, Fox asked McMahon to do the show and McMahon agreed because they promised that Mushnick would be there live. McMahon agreed to do the show believing he could confront Mushnick, who he has never met, although the two have talked several times on the phone. McMahon at one point sued Mushnick in the post, and later dropped the suit. The key person in that scenario was Thomas Cole, who unwittingly became one of the most important pawns in the wrestling industry in 1992 after, allegedly he was fired from his job in the WWF after rebuffing a homosexual advance from the late Terry Garvin a high-ranking company executive, who resigned during the scandal, as did Pat Patterson and ring announcer Mel Phillips, although Patterson was quickly brought back. Mushnick did not actually break this story, it was actually broken by the San Diego Tribune, in a series of scathing front-page stories. But Mushnick reported on it more heavily than any other reporter in the New York market and since in those days the media ran from any serious coverage of wrestling, believing it was neither sport nor entertainment, it was viewed as Mushnick's story by the New York media and probably by Titan Sports as well. Quickly, like within a week or two, Cole settled with the WWF and worked there for a short period of time but because he was viewed by many as the squealer in a sordid business as opposed to being the victim, it was not a happy time for him and he largely wasn't received well. After Garvin's death he called me and he said looking back on his entire ordeal, the only person who he considered honest that he dealt with was Mushnick, who he said he even invited to his wedding. He said the thing that left the worst taste in his mouth was McMahon and Jerry McDevitt attempting to use him as a pawn in their lawsuit against Mushnick which he said was totally groundless. But it is clear that had it not been for Mushnick, it's doubtful Garvin or Phillips would have left the company, and as the reporter who put the most heat on Titan Sports after the Zarian trial, Mushnick was probably the single most influential person in the WWF's foray into steroid testing. Byrne claimed McMahon only did the show because he was promised a face-to-face -face confrontation with Mushnick. All parties involved outside the WWF say the claim is ridiculous, because McMahon had agreed to do the shot three weeks earlier, and Mushnick at that point wasn't even being considered or had even been asked to do the show. Kilmeade said that ever since the start of the show they've been wanting Mushnick on to talk about sports, and not pro wrestling. It always declined because the show is on Sunday and it was a heavy work day for him and he didn't have the time. They asked him for this show since McMahon was already booked, and he for the first time agreed, 
but again said it was the NCAA Final Four weekend and he had to home to write about the television coverage of the games but would appear by phone. The Titan side is that they were told Mushnik would be there live and were never told differently, with Byrne saying his last contact before the show was two days previously, on the evening of March 19th, and he was never told Mushnik wasn't going to be there live. Both Kilmeade and Matthews made it clear at no point was Mushnik ever going to be there live, and Matthews said that Titan Sports was told that specifically on March 11th, before the Lewis Holyfield fight. On March 19th Kilmeade and Mushnik called me telling me about the show and Kilmeade asked me to do the show via satellite. He said that it would be McMahon, Mushnik on the phone, which was made very clear to me, and a child behavioral psychologist, as the guests. He said that when Titan later that day got the word of the guests, they panicked. The list by this point also included Lou Albano, who Matthew said misrepresented himself as a knowledgeable legendary wrestler in the mode of a Bruno Sammartino, who was wanting to take McMahon to task for the directional change of the business. Albano did appear on the show, but in a later segment than McMahon and McMahon's insistence and I agree with him on that one, and had I known Albano was to appear I wouldn't have agreed to appear with him either because it serves no purpose doing a dog and pony comedy show on wrestling in a segment Matthews described as total garbage. Byrne said there was a conversation that day and that the behavior psychologist and Albano's name were brought up, but claimed my name wasn't, but insisted he was never told Mushnik wasn't going to be there. Those at Fox insist he never would have at any time been told Mushnik was going to be there. He said that it was too many people on a panel, although no more than that show normally has. Kilmeade said that Titan balked strongly at the mention of my name, saying that McMahon didn't have time to prepare for me or the child behavior psychologist. On March 20th, in a conversation with someone at Titan Sports, the subject of the show came up and I was told it would be interesting because McMahon and Mushnick would be there live in the same studio. I said I heard about the show and thought that Mushnick wouldn't be in the same studio and was told that they were told that he would. We were promised a one-on-one -on -one with Phil Mushnick, with Brian Kilmeade and Wally Matthews as moderators, said Byrne. We came into the studio and found out Phil Mushnick was phoning it in. I was upset because Phil had wriggled out of another encounter with Vince. They blew it. McMahon and Byrne got to the Fox Studios in New York before the show and both threatened to walk out because Mushnick wasn't there. They were told Mushnick would be there live via phone. Byrne told the producers they were going to walk out if Mushnick was put on. The producers, having plugged McMahon for one week agreed to not put Mushnick on and let McMahon have the segment to himself. According to Byrne, it wasn't McMahon who threatened to walk out, but it was his call claiming McMahon himself may not have even known. Everyone else pointed the finger at McMahon. Byrne claimed McMahon was willing to do the show with Mushnick on phone but had threatened to expose the show on the air, apparently claiming they had promised him Mushnick live, and that Matthews decided not to put Mushnick on to protect him. Just before they went live they said they wanted to patch Phil in, said Byrne. Vince said they could, but he'd bury them on the air because that's not the way it was pitched. Phil was on hold. Vince told Wally and Brian that if you bring him on, I'm going to bury you and they opted out. That's complete bullshit, said Matthews. 110% fiction, said Kilmeade. Both noted that after McMahon had pulled the power play to keep Mushnick off, he then called him a coward for not coming on. Kilmeade said that McMahon insisted he wouldn't do the show if Mushnick was allowed on, and the producer, feeling the need to deliver the guest that was advertised, decided not to allow Mushnick on, saying he felt it was a bad call. When told of Byrne's take on the story, Kilmeade said, they're lying to you. Phil Mushnick was fine with everything. That morning he, McMahon, showed up and pulled that crap. They said if he's not here, it's not fair. That's total crap. I'm mad at the producers for not just calling his bluff. Phil got screwed by us for not letting him tell his side. Those close to McMahon said that he had been preparing very hard for Mushnick and was very disappointed when he came that Mushnick wasn't there, but his actions that day at the studio contradicted that claim. Both hosts were adamant that it wasn't miscommunication and it was open and shut and the Titan side was lying in its version across the board. Mushnick himself was actually on the phone when McMahon cut his promo, and was then shockingly told that McMahon insisted he not be put on or he'd walk off, so they weren't going to put him on. He was furious. Kilmeade said that they wanted Mushnick on the show this Sunday to respond to McMahon. Mushnick, after being treated in that manner, said he was going to refuse. This left McMahon in with Matthews and Kilmeade, neither of whom are knowledgeable about wrestling, and more importantly, were prepared as they had booked the show with them to play moderator for McMahon Mushnick, a child behavior psychologist and whomever else. The conversation went amicable enough with McMahon, who is now very practiced at defending his product, doing much better than on either NBC Dateline or Inside Edition. The clips, more than anything the hosts brought up, of Austin saying ass, bleeped out, and flipping the bird and sable in various stages of undressing, 
or the most damning evidence. McMahon himself when asked if he had a six-year-old, would he let them watch Raw, surprisingly said, absolutely not, but insinuated he would let them watch the morning shows. McMahon said that the Raw show is written for the more than 70% of the audience, which last week actually was 69% but generally it's 63-65%, to 65%, which is 18 or over but felt it was okay for teenagers and that younger children shouldn't watch it unless parents were there monitoring it with them, pointing out as responsible broadcasters, it is rated TV-14, which is a change in rating just done over the last few weeks due to the media heat on the product and wasn't that way through most of the most questionable content period since the show itself has toned down over the past two months. When asked if it would hurt the company if suddenly the teenagers stopped watching, McMahon claimed that it wouldn't, which is pretty laughable considering most of his merchandising, licensing and advertising comes on products aimed toward kids and teenagers. The very reason the WWF is considered such a great buy for advertisers today, and why there is no way there will be any kind of an advertiser backlash, is because few television shows today are a good advertising target to hit teenage boys, and the WWF shows are one of the few great avenues out there for that market. Ultimately, most people directly involved have pointed the finger of blame at the producers of the show. Both Kilmeade and Matthews, while saying they understood her position because McMahon had been plugged all week and they wanted to deliver what was advertised, felt she should have put Mushnick on anyway. Matthews said that if McMahon walked, who cared? They'd spend five minutes burying him and move to boxing, which was the gist of the majority of the show that morning anyway. Matthews also believed there was no way McMahon would walk, because everyone would view that as backing down and McMahon can't back down publicly, even though he basically did, but did so in a scenario when one would figure nobody would find out. Brian and I are devastated that we didn't shut him up even faster, said Matthews. We both later apologized to Phil for not putting him in his place right away. Matthews said he could sympathize with Mushnick's position because he was furious in the past when, after stories he had written critical of Don King, that King had gone on the air and tried to divert from the issues by called him a racist, and the host didn't shut King up. Japanese Television Rundown February 21st, All Japan 1. Hayabusa and Jinsei Shinzaki won the All-Asian Tag Titles beating Tamon Honda and Jun Izumaida in 23-17. The last 10 minutes aired. Shinzaki was a one-match show here as Hayabusa's weaknesses were really exposed when he didn't have good workers to carry him. He did his great flying moves like a moonsault off the top to the floor, a firebird splash and a phoenix splash, but his transition work was awful. The match was saved by a good finishing sequence of near falls ending when Shinzaki pinned Honda after two diving headbutts. Honda is one of these deceptively huge guys, particularly in with two junior heavyweights, that only serve to make Hayabusa and Shinzaki look tiny because of the comparison and ineffective since he can't carry them. Two stars. 2. Mitsuharu Masawa and Yoshinari Ogawa and Masamichi Maru Fuji beat Kana Kobashi and Jun Akiyama and Yoshinobu Kanemaru in 2146. The last 12 minutes aired. Marufuji who is very reminiscent of Misawa as a rookie, is only 175 pounds and 19 years old but shows potential to be a real good worker. Kanemaru is also a really small guy but can work. The work was good most of the way, aside from a rare botched spot in an all-Japan main event, but it was a dead crowd which hurt the match. 3 stars. March 6, New Japan. 1. Scott Norton pinned Masa Saito in 635 with a power slam in Saito's retirement match. This was an even worse idea in practice than it appeared on paper. Norton is the last person anyone should want to work with in their retirement match for all the reasons you can figure. Saito, who hasn't wrestled in more than a year and was something of an ageless performer even into his late 40s, looked old at 56. Saito did his trademark Saito suplex, but with a guy the size of Norton, it really looked like any other back suplex. Because it wasn't the trademark variety, it hurt the pop, and he delivered two lariats before Norton caught him off the ropes with the power slam for the win. Still, this was better than most of Norton's WCW matches. They showed some clips of Saito's retirement ceremony after the match. One quarter star. Two. Masahiro Chono and Akira and NWO Sting beat Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Hiro Saito and Satoshi Kojima in 1741. Only the last five minutes aired, ending with Akira pinning Saito after a splash off the top. Based on what aired, it was a so-so match. One and one quarter stars. Three. Keiji Muto retained the IWGP heavyweight title beating Kensuke Sasaki in 2809. Only the last 10 minutes aired so it's hard to get a good read. 
particularly since this was a psychological as opposed to a spectacular match as Muto told people beforehand he wanted to show he could do a classic old-style world title match without any spectacular spots or even doing his trademark moonsault. He appeared to have accomplished it because the crowd heat was strong and the drama was great toward the end. Muto did a lengthy figure four and when Sasaki made the ropes, it got as big a crowd pop as you'll ever see from the spot, which tends to show the match up to that point must have been pretty gripping. Sasaki used a power bomb off the ropes as Muto set up a Frankensteiner off the top spot. Sasaki had a superheated comeback, limping all the way, building to a scorpion, where due to selling the knee he couldn't exert full pressure and allowing Muto a rope break. Muto reversed a second scorpion into a new type of leg lock similar to a figure four, but Sasaki made the ropes. Muto used a missile drop kick but Sasaki no sold it and started another comeback with a lariat, a sky-high, D-Lo Brown style, power bomb, a regular power bomb and his own Northern Lights bomb for his knee gave out on the final move. He tried it again and again the knee gave out. He tried it a third time but Muto got behind him and rolled it into an armbar which would have been a spectacular finish but was a little sloppy. Sasaki struggled in the hold before the ref stopped the match. I have the impression this match would have looked better in unedited form. 3 and 3 quarter stars. March 7th All Japan. 1. Vader beat Akira Tawe to win the vacant triple crown in 1251. This was way below the standards of a triple crown match. Vader opened with a stiff clothesline and a German suplex and Tawe rolled out. Tawe came back with a stiff clothesline. At about the 740 mark, the match fell apart as miscommunication was obvious and led to four blown spots in a row. Vader looked pissed because there has probably never been a triple crown match in history that fell apart this badly. From that point on it was actually good. Tawe used two high kicks off the apron to the floor. In the ring, Tawe hit two Nodawa but Vader kicked out. He tried a Nodawa off the apron but Vader came back swinging, knocking Tawe off the apron and gave him a splash off the apron onto the floor. In the ring he gave him two more splashes for near falls. The heat got real good at this point. Vader came off the top, but was met with a high kick. Vader then came back with all the wild swinging punches and forearms in the corner on Tawe leading to a power bomb for the pin. One and one half stars. The rest of the show was a lengthy retirement ceremony for Jumbo Tsurida, which also showed clips of some of his most memorable matches of his career. Mexico. In easily the biggest match in Mexico thus far this year, El Eo del Santo and Negro Casas beat Bestia Salvaje and Scorpio Jr. in a mask plus hair versus mask plus hair match which drew a sellout crowd of nearly 18,000 to Arena Mexico on March 19th. In the first fall Santo has his mask ripped and bled and Casas ended up submitting to an armbar from Salvaje. In the second fall Scorpio had his mask ripped and bled, and finally Salvaje gave Casas a low blow and as ref Babe Richard was counting, face ref Roberto Rangel DQ'd Salvaje for the foul, although it appeared he actually didn't see it. Third fall saw the dives and near falls. Santo hit Casas with a tope when Scorpio moved. Eventually Salvaje submitted to Santo's camel clutch to win the third fall. After the lengthy argument period, Scorpio Jr. unmasked as Rafael Nunez, saying his age was 30, he's actually 32, from Mexico City. Salvaje had some of his hair cut but wasn't shaved when it was over. Casas also took out scissors and began cutting his own hair for some reason. The match was said to have been okay for what it was, but no more than three stars. They also held an eight-team tag team tournament with teams composed of 70 stars against teams composed of 90 stars for what was billed as the Salvador Lutteroth slash El Santo Cup, the biggest promoter in the history of Mexico and the biggest wrestling star ever in Mexico. It wound up with the 70s team of Super Astro and Ringo Mendoza beating 90s team of Mr. Niebla and Shocker. Astro got a standing ovation at the end of the tournament. A lot of older fans that usually don't attend apparently came for this because Negro Navarro and El Signo, who were huge stars in the late 70s and early 80s but haven't been around on a big time level in a long time, were over huge. El Gigante Silva, Giant Silva from WWF, debuted in a 3-on-4 teaming with Atlantis and Brasso de Plata over Apollo Dantes and Gran Marcus Jr. and Mascara Año 2000 and Universo 2000. They are back to Arena Coliseo on March 26 and won't return to Arena Mexico until April 30th. The March 26 show is headlined by Silva and Santo and Casas vs. Scorpio Jr. and Salvaje and Marcus and Dantes. Tijuana is running March 26 with Conan and La Parca and Psicosis vs. Rey Mysterio Sr. and Cien Caras and Super Parca on top. 
Black Warrior retained the NWA light heavyweight title in the main event of the March 16th Arena Coliseo show beating Shocker before 5,100 fans. Shocker had pinned Warrior several times both in a non-title match and in trios matches. It was revealed by Dr. Alfonso Morales in Ovaciones which is the biggest national daily sports newspaper that Scorpio Jr. had been wrestling without his mask in WWF on March 18th, which was the day before the big match and pretty well gave away the result. Now that anyone actually believed there was a prayer they were going over with Santo's mask at stake. It was not made into nearly as big a deal as when Rey Mysterio Jr. was going to wrestle the mask versus mask match after losing the mask, or even as big a deal as Viano 4 wrestling two matches without his mask in WCW. In a battle of two of the most famous trainers, also on the March 19th Arena Mexico show, Blue Panther beat 60-year-old Rodolfo Ruiz in eight minutes. The newspapers reported that the fans hated this match and were booing it from start to finish, they also reported both men wrestled well with good holds and counters before Panther won with the armbar submission. All Japan Basically nothing new with the Carnival Tour starting March 26. Motoko Baba held a press conference on March 23rd which was more of a Japanese tradition type of thing. I'm not exactly clear on this, but apparently Japanese tradition is that if the owner of the company dies, that for the first 49 days you run the company but don't make any major changes public. Anyway, this was the 49-day deal, and there was some thought they would announce Mitsuharu Misawa as president, but it didn't happen. Through intermediaries, there has been contact with the WWF about bringing in three wrestlers for the May 2nd Tokyo Dome show, two of whom would have been the New Age Outlaws. WWF turned down the proposal since they have major domestic house shows that weekend the guys would miss including Anaheim, and the proposal wasn't clear who the Outlaws would face and what the result would be. Unlike even last year when after a lot of haggling and bad blood, the two sides did reach a deal for Vader to work the dome, with WWF doing as well as it is, they are far more demanding when it comes to finishes as they don't want their guys' top guys going over to put over Japanese wrestlers. March 14th TV show did a 3.9 rating. New Japan There was a lot of in-ring action leading to the April 10th Tokyo Dome show. Shiro Koshinaka and Kensuke Sasaki won the IWGP tag team titles from Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Satoshi Kojima on March 22nd in Amagasaki before a sellout 6,000 fans when Sasaki pinned Tenzan with a lariat and Northern Lights bomb in 1934. Koji Kanemoto won the IWGP junior title from Jushin Liger on March 17th in Hiroshima before 5,000 fans winning in 31-38 using Liger's own Shota, Palm, followed by a dragon suplex and a moonsault for the pin in what was reported as an excellent match. Kanemoto then blew out his right knee during a tag match on March 20 in Nagoya teaming with Masakazu Fukuda losing to Tatsuhito Takaiwa and Shinjiro Otani, which caused him to miss the final show of the tour, but he will be wrestling at the Dome. This does translate well so it could be an angle, since Otani was in the ring with him and the injury may make it seem like he's in great jeopardy of dropping the title. This leads to a few additions to the April 10th Tokyo Dome show Kanemoto defending against Atani, Dr. Wagner Jr. and Kendo Kashin defending the IWGP Jr. tag titles against Jushin Liger and Great Sasuke, and Koshinaka and Sasaki defending the IWGP tag team titles against the legends duo of Genichiro Tenryu and Tatsumi Fujinami. Also on the show will be Tenzan and Kojima vs. Yuji Nagata and Manabu Nakanishi, which is interesting because on the March 22 Amagasaki show, Nakanishi and Nagata did a split up after losing to Tenryu and Fujinami. As part of the angle leading to the Atsushi Onita vs. Masahiro Chono electrified explosive barbed wire match, which will be the opener on the show, Chono supposedly demanded that this match isn't videotaped and won't appear on television, which I guess is an attempt to move ticket sales. It was also announced now that Ted Tanabe, Onita's picked referee, will not be doing the match due to a schedule conflict and there are rumors because ticket sales aren't doing well, that they'll make Ricky Choshu the referee. They also announced that Fry would be allowed to wear his UFC gloves and punch to the face in the title match with Muto. Speaking of Onita, he is going to high school starting March 23rd in Tokyo. Onita started pro wrestling at the age of 15 so he never graduated high school, and they are saying at the age of 41, he's going back to get his degree. There was a report in Weekly Fight that New Japan is considering doing yet another Tokyo Dome show in June with a Shinya Hashimoto vs. Naoya Ogawa main event. One thing New Japan experimented with on this tour is allowing the junior heavyweights to work main events. The Liger vs. Kanemoto match was the advertised main event in Hiroshima, which drew just under capacity, although it didn't go on last in the building as they put Fry vs. Fujinami, with Fry making Fujinami tap out to an armbar in 642, 
after it. The biggest show of the week was March 20th at Nagoya Rainbow Hall which drew 10,000 in a 13,000-seat building going with a junior heavyweight tag title match with Wagner Jr. and Kashin beating El Samurai and Gran Hamada in 1449 when Kashin used the armbar on Samurai as the advertised main event. It's interesting because New Japan maybe once a year will put the junior heavyweights as the main event on a card, but this wasn't even a strong drawing junior heavyweight match to be in that position. They tried to spice it up as Wagner Jr. had his mask taken off so he was seen exposed in the final five minutes of the match. Kashin not only challenged Hamada, but also Hamada's daughters, two of whom are wrestlers, after the match. The other big story during the week was the big push for Fry leading to his April 10th IWGP title match against Keiji Muto. Fry scored submission wins over Fujinami on March 17th in Hiroshima, Manabu Nakanishi on March 20th and longtime rival Kazuyuki Fujita on March 22nd, the latter two with chokes. Also on March 22nd after a six-man with Mudo and Big Titan and Hiro Saito versus Akira and Masahiro Chono and NWO Sting saw Fry attack Mudo after the match and punch and kick him around and lock him in an armbar. Yuki Ishikawa and Alexander Otsuka of Battlers, who appear on the Dome show were at the March 20th Nagoya card before the fans. They had earlier worked the Battlers show in the same city which drew 1,320. March 13th TV show did a 3.7 rating. Other Japan notes. The last UFC heavyweight champion, Randy Couture, made his pro wrestling debut in what is believed to have been a shoot match, getting upset by Iliakine Mikhail with an armbar in 7.43 on the March 22nd Rings show at Tokyo Bay NK Hall before 4,502 fans. It makes Couture's second straight loss in Japan, as he had lost on October 24th in the Valley Tudo Open Japan to Winston Inoue in 90 seconds to an armbar. The main event on the show was almost surely a worked match with Kiyoshi Tamura beating Hiromitsu Kaneara in 2044 with an armbar, since there was no way they'd risk Tamura in a shoot this close to the Frank Shamrock match on April 23rd in Osaka. Another interesting result on the show was Yoshihisa Yamamoto's win over Valentijan Overeem in 240. FMW ran a major show on March 19th at the Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center before 4,500 with Hiramichi Koto Fuyuki retaining his unified world title beating Mr. Ganesuke in 2032 in a bloodbath. After the match it was announced that Fuyuki's next title defense would be on May 5th at Yokohama Bunka Gym against Tarzan Goto, who actually quit FMW and hasn't returned since April of 1995. All Japan's all-Asian tag titles were defended by FMW's Hayabusa and Michinoku's Jinsei Shinzaki beating Masato Tanaka and Tetsuhiro Kuroda on 30-35 when Hayabusa pinned Kuroda with the Falcon Press. All Japan also did a rarity of sending talent, although it turned out to be mid-card wrestlers Masafuchi and Tsuyashi Kikuchi, to this show beating Geto and Koji Nakagawa in a match with an all-Japan referee with Kikuchi pinning Nakagawa in 15-55 with a Thunder Fire Power Bomb. Currently in FMW is a masked tag team called Armageddon. The report I was given is that Armageddon number one is Sika Anoya and number two is Solo Fafatu, Fatu and Sultan in WWF. However, magazine sources indicate that number one is Solo Fafatu and number two is a much younger Samoan wrestler. It's hard to believe that Sika, who would be around 55 these days and has hardly wrestled in years, is one of the two. FMW started its tag team tournament on March 21st in Hamamatsu with such teams as Hiskatsu Oya and Ganasuk. Haido and Yukihiro Kanemura, Armageddon's, Hayabusa, and Fuyuki, Geto and Nakagawa and Tanaka and Kuroda with the finals on May 31st at Karakuen Hall. To show how much you can trust indie attendance figures in Japan, the March 20th war show in Matsumoto headlined by Tenryu retaining his J1 Rikido's and title beating Nobutaka Araya was listed in the newspapers as drawing 2,800 fans when the real number was 400. 1970s legend Billy Robinson has moved to Japan to be the head trainer at the newly opened UWF Snake Pit Japan Gym. Robinson, Luthez and former UWFI wrestler Yuko Miyato held a press conference on March 18. The Snake Pit name is taken from a legendary hooker's submission school in Wigan, England where Robinson and Carl Gotch were probably the most famous students. In wrestling folklore Robinson and Gotch were always considered along with possibly Danny Hodge as the best of the shooters from the 70s era. It was announced that Miyato is the owner, and that Robinson would be the head coach. Big Japan will hold a rematch with Big Japan Deathmatch Champion Shadow WX, Satoru Shiga, defending against Abdullah the Butcher on April 17 at Karakuen Hall. It will be called a Hell Prison Wire Chain Handcuff Match where the only way to win is for the doctor to stop the match. Former wrestler and manager Ikamasa, KY, Wakamatsu, who was something of a legend in the Calgary territory 15 to 20 years back, 
will be running for city election in Ashibetsu, his hometown, on April 25th. He was best known for being the manager of the Machine Army, which included Giant Machine, Andre the Giant under a mask if you can believe that, in the mid-80s New Japan during one of those periods where their booking brains were bankrupt. If you recall, that flopped so big that WWF actually copied the idea in 1986 by briefly making Andre a masked wrestler, and it flopped even worse there. Pancrase held a press conference on March 19 to announce that they would start a program of sorts with the Wajita Kishu Gym. The biggest star from that gym in Akira Shoji, who has appeared on several KRS shoot shows including Beating Valid Ismail, the recent conqueror of Hoist Gracie, on the October 11th Tokyo Dome card. Shoji said he wanted to fight both Minoru Suzuki and Masakatsu Fanaki. The first match involving that gym will be on April 18th at the pay-per-view from Yokohama Bunka Gym with Pancrase rookie Daisuke Ishii facing Daiju Takase, 21, best known for beating 680-pound Emmanuel Yarbrough in a shoot MMA match last year by basically running away until Yarbrough practically passed out from exhaustion. At least judging from photos, and in a shoot show that is usually very little to go by, the March 9th Pancrase show looked to be the most brutal show of the year. In particular, a Valley Tudo rules match with Yuhi Sano of Takata's Dojo against Keiichiro Yamamiya of Pancrase, which Yamamiya won, I think via blood, saw Sano bleeding as heavily as anyone I've seen in a shoot match in a long time. Battlerts and JWP ran a joint show on March 21st in Osaka with a mixed tournament that ended with Alexander Otsuka and Azumi Hyuga and Hikari Fukuoka over Dynamite Kansai and Mohamed Yone and Maya Hashimoto in the finals with the over-the-top rope elimination rules. They also held the finals of a lengthy singles tournament in Battlerts with Masaaki Mochizuki losing to Minoru Tanaka. They've added a bunch of stipulations to the GIA 4th anniversary show on April 4th at Yokohama Bunka Gym starting at 4 p.m. The main event would be the first singles match with legendary partners Chigusa Nagio vs. Linus Asuka, who are by far the most famous woman tag team in history, as the 80s crush gals in probably 10 years. If Asuka wins, she will become president of GIA Promotions and win Nagio's all-world title. If Nagio wins, Asuka and all of her protégés must join the GIA Promotion and take a huge cut in pay to do so. Great Sasuke did a clean pinfall loss in an eight-man tag to Shima Nobunaga on March 20th in Kamiyama. Here and there. Shawn Michaels and Jose Lothario's debut show of the Texas Wrestling Alliance was on March 20th in San Antonio before about 400 fans, with a tournament to determine the first TWA champion. Ending with heel Ken Johnson beating Jose's son Pete in the finals. The biggest name in the tourney is Shuichi Funaki, who is helping Michaels and Lothario train wrestlers as he lives in San Antonio. Road Warrior Hawk also worked the show. The next show is April 2nd with Johnson vs. Godfather scheduled on top. Michaels did a run-in at the end of the Hawk vs. Desperado match, but took no bumps. The latest USWF show drew 4,500 fans in Amarillo with Evan Tanner keeping his USWF heavyweight title beating Mike Chizek in 206 by a knockout, after a series of knees. Eric Payne retained the lightweight title beating Mark Cantu in 332 with an armbar, and Larry Parker, who has done Kingdom, won a light heavyweight tournament to set him up for a match on May 22nd in Amarillo against champion Paul Jones. Tanner is booked on the April 18th Pancrase pay-per-view show and will return with literally no rest for a title defense on April 24th in Lubbock. It was the final USWS show at its home base at the Fairgrounds Coliseum which is being torn down, so the shows are going to have to be moved to a 2,500-seat venue. In Memphis on the March 19th show in the Lawler and Dundee and Streak vs. Sean Stasiak and Vic Grimes and Baldo match, it was Stasiak that did the job and has to leave town, so he'll be starting in the WWF after WrestleMania. The finish saw Stacy lift up her skirt and give Stasiak and panty shot and Lawler pinned him. Glenn Kolka debuted as the so-called cousin of Michael Hayes who has been in jail the past several years and claiming Hayes turned his back on him. Kolka arrived in a mask and he and Baldo destroyed Hayes' left leg with a chair and handcuffed him and threw him in a van and drove off. Randy Hales and downtown Bruno actually challenged announcers Dave Brown and Corey Macklin to a match. Later in the show, Stacy turned on Lawler and announced she would be managing the Fabs, Stan Lane and Steve Kiern, when they returned to Memphis to face Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee on April 2nd at the New Daisy Theater. Lawler said that it was he and Jerry Jarrett who came up with the idea to put Lane and Kiern together, and they were just curtain jerkers before he put them together as a team and said that they never thanked him for their break. Steve Bradley, as Sensational Steve won the Young Guns title on March 19th in Memphis. Reports are that Bradley looks real good. The tag title was also held up on March 19th, 
and a match was held at TV on March 20th with Kid Wicked and Derek King vs. Aaron O'Grady and Vic Grimes which ended with O'Grady and Grimes capturing the belts. Kurt Angle also debuted this week. Stacy claimed that when she went with Lawler to visit Hugh Hefner WWF Angle, that Lawler hogged all the spotlight and never let her meet Hefner, and that's why she's bringing the Fabs back. They announced Brandon Baxter would be undergoing shoulder surgery, I believe he legit separated his shoulder a few weeks ago. Hales and Bruno again tried to get Brown and Macklin to wrestle but they refused until they started getting on Macklin's family, and he jumped in there against both. Macklin pinned Bruno after an elbow drop, and the crowd went nuts. Kulka then attacked Macklin. Brian Christopher and Spellbinder Streak in Memphis, defend the NWA North American tag titles against the Tennessee Vols on March 25th, which will almost surely be the title change back. The Fabulous Ones vs. Lawler and Dundee Nashville match has been moved May 1st. NWA New England ran an angle which had some, among them NWA President Howard Brody, somewhat upset as a shoot although recognizing part of this is an angle. At the TV tapings on March 13th, Sheldon Goldberg, the a and &E wrestling historian on the Chris Mortensen produced pieces that are usually lacking when it comes to history, who is the on-TV commissioner for the group, said he couldn't believe the NWA tag titles held by the Brotherhood were held up because they missed the match in Texas because of a snowstorm that wouldn't allow them to fly out of Boston. He said NWA New England was still recognizing the Brotherhood as the champs. He said NWA New England would no longer recognize any of the NWA champions and pulled out a belt and claimed it was the same belt worn by Flair, Thez, and Terry Funk. He said the NWA titles should be won in the ring and not sold to the highest bidder, in reference to the Severn Ogawa match and they would be holding a tournament on May 22nd to crown their own world champion. I know that a lot of people aren't going to like reading this, but the NWA, despite having small promotions aligned with them on several continents, as a title that meant little except Dan Severn had some credibility as a shooter, before Severn went to WWF, and absolutely nothing once he was there and didn't make it as a star and they didn't even refer to him as champion. There is nobody in the US that could change that. No matter how you slice it, the Ogawa match put the NWA back in the news, particularly in Japan and even in the US, in a way that nothing else could have. I don't know where they go from here, but for anyone to knock that change as being a bad business move for the NWA as an organization doesn't see the big picture. If you are ever in South Bend, Indiana, the University of Notre Dame Library houses a collection from late wrestling promoter Jack Pfeffer, who was a major name in the business for 45 years. According to Notre Dame Library Literature, the collection, donated by Eddie Einhorn, comprises material saved by Pfeffer, a major historical figure in the 30s and 40s in particular, which includes business and financial records, personal correspondence, newspaper and magazine clippings and programs. Independent Championship Wrestling on March 27th in Rend Lake College in Ina, Illinois with California Kid vs. Doug Gilbert on top. The March issue of Milwaukee Magazine has a full-color article on local independent wrestling. After a collapse lung last week, Stevie Richards was back in the ring on indie shows this weekend. It turned out his shoulder injury was a bruise and not a separation and was feared last week. Dale Gagner's AWA ran March 13th in Deadwood, South Dakota with newspaper and TV ads listing such names as The Oddities, The Brood, The Hart Foundation, led by world-famous Tony Hart, and Doink the Clown. A newspaper ad for the show called it WWF and AWA Superstars present Shotgun Saturday Night. The TV spots showed clips of Flair, Zabishko, Slaughter, and Bischoff. The show drew 450 fans. They had a Golga, billed as being from the WWF, but it was a 5 foot 10 guy. A guy named Turbo was announced as being a WWF star, a guy named Samson was announced as being a member of DOA in the WWF, etc. British Wrestling Federation is running a tour featuring Yokozuna from April 6th to May 30th along with Fatu along with local British stars. In Puerto Rico, the current headline feud is Ray Gonzalez defending the Universal title against Pierre Roth Jr. and Carlos Colon vs. Chicky Star over the Puerto Rican title. Gonzalez vs. Pierre Roth with the Universal title against the Intercontinental title takes place March 27th in Guanabo while the WWC tag titles are at stake, don't even know who has them, with Cologne and Shane, Shane Sewell vs. Chicky Star and Victor. <laughs> MMA There was a tentative UFC card for the May 7th pay-per-view show, which will be from Birmingham, Alabama, released last week but apparently there are numerous changes that are going to be made. About the only matches that look likely from that lineup are the Boss Rudin vs. Kevin Randleman main event to determine the vacant UFC heavyweight champion, and a Pedro Rizzo vs. Pete Williams match and there is talk of Gary Goodridge vs. Suyashi Kosaka but that is probably nowhere close to being put together. 
While not announced officially, three more matches seem to have been put together for the April 29th KRS show at Nagoya Rainbow Hall, Takata vs. Mark Coleman and Ensign Inoue vs. Mark Kerr main events, being Vitor Belfort vs. Kazushi Sakuraba, which is a very interesting match since both have won UFC heavyweight tournaments. Alan Goes vs. Satoshi Honma, who destroyed pro wrestler Yui Sano on the October 11th Tokyo Dome show and Igor Vachinchin, a Russian boxer who has something like a 24-1 and MMA record, facing Akira Shoji. Frank Shamrock has basically agreed to terms to defend his UFC middleweight title on the September pay-per-view show against Tito Ortiz. Shamrock is fighting Tamura in Japan on April 23rd, and will be taking time off planning for, and getting married in June. UFC is hoping that will be its breakout show as they are lobbying hard to get it in Las Vegas, with the idea that approval of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, which is considered the single most influential commission in the country, would lead to a reversal by major pay-per-view companies such as TCI and Time Warner, who won't carry the show for political reasons. According to Mark Ratner, who heads the Nevada Commission, they are in serious discussion with Semaphore Entertainment Group officials regarding approval, but that unfortunately for both sides things are moving slower than either side would like. It appears that there will be a hearing before the entire commission within the next 30 days. It is a controversial issue and there is one point that has become a major impasse, and that is striking an opponent on the ground. The commission may have a hard time with that being legal and that is a point that UFC can't bend on. All other points seem to be able to be negotiated into compromises. Radner is considering proposing to the commission approving one show as an experimental show prior to sanctioning it as a sport. On the K-1 front, there is no set date for a return to Las Vegas. The Mirage Hotel was said to have been very pleased with the first show which drew a sellout crowd, but apparently due to it dying on pay-per-view, the show was a big money loser. The Mirage wants a show on August 21st, but K1 has scheduled its Japan Grand Prix tournament, the winner goes to the World Grand Prix, for August 22nd, at either the Yokohama Arena or Ariaki Coliseum. K1 has revised its 1999 schedule. The first major show will be April 25th at Yokohama Arena with Ernesto Hust vs. Francisco Filio as the main event plus Peter Ertz and Andy Hug appearing, and they announced a UFC star would make his debut on the card. June 20th will be a show in Fukuoka, July 18th will be an eight-man one-night tournament at Nagoya Rainbow Hall October 13th at Osaka Dome, and December 5th at Tokyo Dome for the Grand Prix Finals. The July show was originally supposed to be at the Nagoya Dome, but was moved to the 13,000-seat building. The plan was for a 32-man Grand Prix instead of 16 men as in the past, but the change in Nagoya locations may mean a change in tournament plans. The annual Zurich Switzerland show featuring Hug is June 5th. K1 ran March 22nd at Tokyo Yoyogi Gym 2 before a sellout 5,600 fans for a B-level show. Pro wrestler Yoji Anjo ended up going to a five-round draw with Duncan James. In the main event, Peter Ertz defeated Jim Mullen, who was fought in both UFC and Draka, knocking him out with a high kick at 125 of the third round. Sam Greco's squash match with Samuel Benazos ended in a no contest as Greco, who was clearly winning the fight, suffered a badly cut leg and the doctor stopped the match. UFC lightweight champ Pat Militic and sometimes training partner Jeremy Horn, who has fought in three UFCs, one and two record, was a no-striking allowed match on a hook-and-shoot show in Evansville on March 20 which ended in a time-limit draw. I saw some photos of Mark Kerr winning the Abu Dhabi submission tournament and to say I was shocked would be an understatement. In UFC this guy was 255 and looked like a shorter version of Lou Ferrigno in his prime without the green paint. In this tournament he was said to be 220, but looked much smaller and actually looked skinny. ECW Aside from the pay-per-view, not a lot to mention. Despite all the rumors to the contrary, there is not nor has there ever been any consideration given to doing a Taz vs. Sid title match for all the reasons any logical person could come up with. Mosco de la Merced from Mexico is scheduled to start in a few weeks to feud with Super Crazy. Consideration is being given to a new Jack vs. Mustafa Cage match build as a Gangsta's Paradise match on the May 16th pay-per-view show. Chris Condito and Tammy Sitch have consented to being drug tested in two weeks. One of the conditions of their return to the promotion was to pass a drug test, which would be the first two given in the history of the company. <laughs>